What's up, guys? We are live here. Welcome to the Baxter Riches Podcast. I'm Zach Ginn, your host. I quitted my minimum wage bag boy job to pursue the riches of real estate investing at the age of 17 and never looked back. I'm here to educate and inform entrepreneurs, young and old, how to become complete real estate investors by talking to the best and most powerful minds in real estate. Guys, I have a treat for you guys here. I have Dedrick and Crystal Polite. They are all the way coming from Greensboro, North Carolina. They are the power couple in real estate investing, and they are here to share their story. Thank you guys so much for coming on today. Thank you for having us, Zach. Thank you for having us. Sweet. So uh, let's get let's get let's get everything over. Let's get done. How did you guys get started in real estate investing? Well, we got started in real estate uh, at a young age, just like you. I remember reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad when I was 21. I was a sophomore in college and that really changed my outlook on money. And I was like, I got to get into real estate. There's some kind of way I have to get these rental properties so I can generate passive income and I don't have to work a nine to five. So it was really at a, at a young age that I, I, I caught the bug, uh, bought my first house when I was 25, did a house hack. Uh, and that's how I really got into the game. I actually read a book on how to buy houses with no money down and get cash back at closing. I followed what it said in the book and I bought a $400,000 triplex in Boston, zero money down and got a $1,200 check back at closing. So at that point I had I had the bug, I was bitten, but then I didn't do anything for about 10 years. I went back to my corporate job, read books, went to all the seminars, didn't do anything until I met this beautiful young lady right here. And she was like, dude, what are you doing? Like you have all this knowledge, you read all these books, let's actually take action. And a couple of years ago, we started taking action, and now we're uh, we're rolling. Wow, the, I mean, your story is so crazy. I, I've actually heard your story before. That's why I had to get you on here. You know, it, you see uh, people like you, and they're like, "Wow, they just started within five years. They got all this money. They did all good." I think there's some pretty interesting prerequisites that you actually had, both of you guys. It just it, it's such a crazy meeting the minds between you guys. You, you've become like the craziest power couple in wholesaling. I see. Um, I see here that you were making over six figures selling uh, kitchen knives and Crystal was like this crazy uh, like productions lady just like killing it out there. I mean, what is your experience in sales before real estate and how did that help you in wholesaling now? Yeah, for me, um, I got into sales when I was in college. I sold cut knives. Uh, I didn't go door to door like a lot of people here, but um, that was my first way I cut my teeth in sales. I ended up... Uh, becoming a, a All-American, earning a scholarship, basically paying my way through college from doing sales. And I've been doing sales ever since, since 2001, when I was in college. Um, and then again, I met I met her. She was a teenage entrepreneur like yourself, Zach. So I, I, that resonates a lot. She was 17, 18. She started throwing parties, making money that way. Then you want to tell a little bit about your, your story in talks? Yeah. So then I, like you said, I went into college and I started writing, producing, and directing my own stage play. Um, I've just been, I've known since probably six, seven years old that I was going to be an entrepreneur. Um, and I've never wavered from that. So every job I've ever taken has been very strategic and it was a job that I knew had to help me get to the next level. So, um, every job I would leave <clears throat> no longer, I would never stay any longer than two years. And that's if I really needed to get something from this job. Um, but I would literally quit on a dime. As soon as I got what I needed, I was out of there. Um, so um, when I met him, he knew he, you know, it was great. We were already aligned in a lot of ways. So all I needed to know with him was, was he an entrepreneur? Wow. Wow. So did you guys start real estate? So you said at 25, you were in real estate, but when did you guys specifically start like all like we're all in this is what we're doing this is it like were you guys already together at that point yes yeah we met in 2009 we just set it up yep. celebrated our 10 year anniversary or 11 five years being married wow we went all in on real estate in 2017. we actually um got married we both had full-time jobs and again we we were wanting to be full-time entrepreneurs so we were trying to plan our, our exit from the rat race so 2016, we actually bought a franchise. We bought a business. We still were working full time. Each of us in our full time jobs. We had a kid. 
We were trying to figure out how to escape. So we bought a business, ran that for a little while, but it didn't give us the freedom that we wanted to quit our jobs. So at, after a year and a half of running that business, we sold it. We sold it for twice what we invested in it. So we made some money, took that money, and then we piled it into real estate. We started hiring coaches, hiring mentors, getting educated to learn the real estate business. And that was in 2017. Wow. So what are we are you are we talking here wholesaling wise, actually getting into the business? Or are you talking about like buying rental properties? So what what's no, the whole it's crazy. 2017, January, we went to our first three um, real estate flipping event. Jamel Gibbs was actually the the teacher of that event. And that's what we were like, okay, we want to get into investing. Um, from that point, we started learning, we started going to more masterminds and um, hiring experts and coaches to teach us marketing. We wanted to flip houses. We didn't have the capital to buy houses, cash or flip houses. So we were like, okay, we have to learn wholesaling to get capital in order to take down rental properties. And that's, that's kind of the start of our journey. Wow, so it, it's so crazy. So what made you guys make the move from uh, Boston to uh, North Carolina? Well, we uh, <laughs> that would be me. So my mom had just retired and moved uh, here back to North Carolina. So I'm originally from here. I grew up in Boston. So Boston was home for me. Um, and we had just found out we were pregnant. And um, I told him I want to be around my mother. <laughs> so I said, I'm going to Boston. You can join me. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to North Carolina. You can join me. Uh, he's like, well, you're not leaving me. I said, well, then you better hop on this train because I'm out of here. Um, and literally within a month, I think we left. So yeah. I, we told my mother in October, we were down here in November. Was yeah. it? Yeah. yeah, we were down here in November. Prior to coming here um, and prior to even the animal rides business, Dedrick and I had uh, Airbnb together. And this is before anyone knew what it was. It 2012, was 2012. Before it was a household name. Right. Wow. So we were dating two months in and he yeah. came up with, hey, I know a way we can you know, make money off your apartment. And I was like, okay. What? Well, I'm in. He's like, well, it was Airbnb and told me all about it. I said, okay, just let me know what I need to do and we'll take it from there. So we um, Airbnb my apartment for what, maybe six months. And that was literally all the way up until we left to come here and made what is about 30,000 mm -hmm. um, in six months. So that also got us really interested in the real estate, um, the real estate genre as well. Wow. I mean, it, I think it's so crazy how people just end up in like the, like the best markets, like North Carolina right now is on fire, like wholesaling wise, real estate investing. I mean, do you think you would have the same results if you tried what you did in North Carolina in Boston? Um, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. because not on the scale. So we still mm -hmm. also do a lot of business in Boston as well. So that is our backyard to us because we both grew up there since we were, my, I think my mom moved there. I was eight. <clears throat> um, so we do a lot of deals there as well, not the volume. So let me rephrase that. We don't do the volume as in North Carolina because they don't have, the price points are a lot higher. But um, I t we tell people all the time, it could easily be done in Boston, just your technique and your marketing has to be different. Definitely. Uh, I mean, marketing is probably the lifeline, the lifeline of my business, hundred percent. I mean, what is some of your marketing secrets that you can share with us in North Carolina in your business? Well, our number one marketing secret is this woman right here. <laughs> she is the marketing ninja. Um, if you looked at our desk right here, our table, she has a puzzle here. So she loves puzzles. That's what she does in her free time. It's like put together puzzles. And she looks at marketing as a puzzle. And man, once she focused on marketing, you know, I handle the acquisitions, the sales, the finance. She handles marketing, branding, that type of things. And I mean, she's amazing at it. From So really our biggest secret, which is not a secret anymore, is driving for dollars. Just about everyone who knows us knows us as the couple who you know made a fortune driving for dollars still think it's the best list you can find is literally going i don't care you can drop me in nairobi kenya and i will drive for dollars and find a beat up shack yep. and get it under contract <laughs> and sell it to somebody for a goat <laughs> but wow. it, it, it works anywhere right just finding these dilapidated houses they exist in every single every single city and town in america contacting the seller 
getting it on the contract and then selling that contract or closing on it yourself. I think one of the best parts about driving for dollars is it's not a list that you can buy. Now there's a lot of investors in Greensboro, North Carolina. They all buy a high equity list and then go mail to that list. But that specific deal that you just drove by, it's like, you're not going to have five other Greensboro investors call them. Absolutely. Is that, Absolutely. but I, I mean, here, here comes the biggest issue. Uh, this is going to be the, where everyone's going to stop and say, well, Dedrick, Crystal, driving for dollars is nice, but I don't have the time for it. What do you say to those people that, that they don't have the time for it? They're a solopreneur trying to get it done. Then you find someone who does have the time. So that's where deal finders come into play. My very first deal finder was um, my mom. So she was the very first person who started driving. She still drives for uh, for a day. She was like, how do you figure out this deal machine? And she, she crushes it. She literally crushes it um, driving for dollars. But what we figured out is we can't be everywhere at once. So you find people in the areas for which you want to um, be in, you want to market to, you want to uh, get your feet wet in, and you have them drive for you. Um, and it's always great when you have um, natives, so to speak, to the area, because they're going to know, yeah. like, mom, she knows the back streets, she knows the front streets, <laughs> she literally knows areas um, that we we don't know because we grew up in Boston, whereas she grew up here. Um, and then she also knows one of the things that she told us that we didn't believe um, when we first got here. She was like, hey, this area is going to be booming. And we was like, oh, no, don't nobody want to live there. <laughs> she was like, listen, you got to get into this area because it's going to be booming. I'm from here. I know this. And it took us a couple years to listen to her. And I'm so mad that we did because that's a couple of years that we lost because that is one of the hottest areas right now um, for where we yeah. market to. So always look for natives in the area where you want to uh, market and you want to be in and get them to drive for you. And to that, Zach, um, someone, if someone ever said to me, I can't drive for dollars, I don't have the time, I would ask them, are you disabled? Are you a quadriplegic? Are you, did you ever leave the house? Because every time we leave the house, right. we are driving for dollars. Like we, we could be going to Target. And if we pass a house that looks vacant, it looks run down, the grass isn't cut, we're pulling out a deal machine and we're putting it in the app, right? Yep. If they don't own the house, even if they do own it, we're going to yeah. deal machine the house. So you got to make it kind of part of your lifestyle. Imagine if every house that you, you took a picture of in the deal machine app paid you $1,000. You got a direct deposit the next yep. day. That's how we look at driving for dollars. There's deals yeah, in every single city. So just make it a part of your daily life. As you're going around town, running errands, doing whatever you do, open your eyes and look for properties that have signs of distress. And try going different ways as well. So if I know I'm going to my mother's house and I may not take the highway, I may take the main roads, but I may go a different route. That's how we actually find a lot of these properties as well, because we take these little hidden random, street, side, random streets, side streets <laughs> looking for houses, looking for houses and we, find them. and we find them and we end up contracting them. One of the things I know you asked earlier um, when we started driving for dollars, did we start wholesaling? Um, we did. But at the same time, we started buying hold. So in the very beginning, um, which is one of the things we tell a lot of couples and a lot of individuals is you got to know have your end in mind, <clears throat> excuse me, have your end in mind and know your goals. What are you doing this for? Ours from the very beginning was to build a rental portfolio, something that we can, um, and not just rentals, land, everything, for, something that we can literally um, bring our kids into and they can take over um, at some point. But so from the very beginning, that's what we've been doing. So we didn't start wholesaling and it made a ton of money and then started buying holding. No, we've tried to take down every house we've ever <laughs> got, under contract. got under contract. We first look, when we get a house under contract, we're like, how can we buy this ourselves? Yes. If we lost all the strategies of buying it ourselves, then and only then do we assign it and wholesale to someone yep. else. Majority we keep for ourselves. Yeah. Okay. Follow up question on that one. Are you getting loans for these properties or are you just buying them all cash when you're going to hold them so we take it on a case-by-case -case basis yeah. Zach. Mm -hmm. um you know as you know depending on where your business is sometimes you can buy cash or yep. if you just close on three properties you may have to get a bank loan you may have to 
go tap your private money sources. You may have to use hard money. So it really depends on a case by case basis. Creative financing, seller finance, subject to. So we literally have properties in our portfolio that hits on every single bucket. Wow. So who is, I mean, 99% of all successful real estate investors that are like two teams of two or like power couples like you guys, one's a visionary and one's an integrator. Who's the visionary and who's the integrator? She's the visionary. I'm the integrator. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. I, usually the acquisitions guy, in my opinion, is the integrator. Uh, since you're the integrator, Dedrick, could you tell me some some of your KPIs in North Carolina when it comes to driving for dollars? Yeah, it's all about volume. It's a numbers game, just like any anything else. So when it comes to driving for dollars, is you know how many properties did you upload into the app and take pictures of? Um, how many mailers do we have going out on a weekly or monthly basis? And then I look in my phone system and say, okay, I sent out a thousand postcards. How many phone calls did that generate? All right, that generated 100 phone calls. How many offers went out? How many appointments? And you just track it down there. How many contracts did we get? And then how many deals did we ultimately close from that? So those are the metrics. I, and uh, we also do things in addition to driver for dollars. We, we do cold calling. So we have a team that cold calls for us. We do um, messaging. And ringless voicemail. Ringless voicemail. So again, with marketing, there's no one silver bullet. Absolutely. <laughs> the key to marketing, in the, especially in wholesaling, is consistency. Yep. That's that's the secret. Because we, we run into people like, oh, I tried deal machine, it didn't work. I tried driving for dollars. So we start asking them questions. Um, how many properties did you identify and upload into the app? Well, like 50. How many postcards did you send out? Oh, I didn't send out any. <laughs> okay, well, there's no wonder it didn't work. You got to really be willing to say, okay, I'm going to put in 200 properties a month. I'm going to send them a postcard every 30 days for six to 12 months. And you got to be in it for the long game in order to see results. Okay. And the, the million dollar question too is I, I get a million of these questions. So when you, let's say you find the deal, you find the Holy grail, you're driving or your partner, whatever drives, you find the dilapidated property. What do you do once you get in deal machine? What is your, like, what's the best way for you to get a deal from there? So literally you find the property, you pull it up in Deal Machine, you snap a picture. We have various templates. So if it's a vacant house, we have a certain verbiage that goes in a postcard that goes to that owner. If it's a looks like a tired landlord property or absentee owner, what have you, we send them a postcard. We send a postcard once every 30 days and we put it on repeat for 12 months. So it's literally oh, wow. and forget it. Um, in addition to that, every 30 days or so, we'll list out a deal machine so we found a thousand properties dri driving around our, our town we pulled out a deal machine then we do other forms of marketing we'll hit them with the ringless voicemail we'll hit that list with a cold call we'll hit them with a text because no one's going to respond to a certain form of marketing right someone your dad's age may respond to direct mail because he's of the older generation someone your age who owns a house is gonna they're not going to read their mail they're going to respond to a text faster so you have to employ different forms of marketing to have a better chance of reaching your prospects. So everything with us is on a conveyor belt. So every list of ours goes through a conveyor belt. And that list is hit multiple times. Right now we have lists that are going through our text message campaign that um, are two years old. And we've hit them, different. We've hit them now that we got a reputable text messaging company that is amazing. Um, which is REI Rail, who just launched their text division. And we've had so much success with that, that um, we've probably locked up about 30 deals in the past two months, just off of this new, um, off of these two year old lists that we've hit with direct mail. We've cold called them. We hit them with Ringo's voicemail. And this isn't one time. We've hit all these lists a minimum of four times under each and the mailers have went out for 12 months straight most people would have given up right 98 percent of investors would have said you know what i've spent about 30 dollars on each one of these houses on this list and i haven't gotten a lead or a deal but again we're committed to marketing because we know marketing is the tip of the spear marketing is how you find deals now once you find a deal you can use one of 10 different exit strategies to make money off it but it's all start it all starts with marketing so if you have an old list don't throw it away just hit it with a different marketing source. Um, but, and it doesn't matter how old it is, I 
you, you're going to pull some leads from there. And don't forget, we're living in a different time. So I, I tell people now, this is the best time to literally refurbish all your list, every single list you ever had. Yeah, it's a different world. It's where it's like you said, a different world right now. People who may not have been motivated in 2019 when you contacted them, now that we've had a global pandemic, their financial situation may have changed. They may need money. They may be motivated, more motivated than ever right now. Make sure you switch up. If you're doing direct mail, if you're doing text messaging, switch up your verbiage on those cards saying, hey, uh, did your tenant stop paying? Who, who, as a landlord, who tenant hasn't? We have tenants who've stopped paying. So you ask them, have your tenants stopped paying? Are you in a financial bind? Um, put in their heads what might not have been in there. So 90% of our leads are from individuals who are tired landlords who didn't know they were tired until they received our postcard. And, they, and they've said it like, well, I didn't know I was looking to sell until I got your postcard. I'm definitely interested now. So keep that in mind when you even with your text texting people put that as part of your verbiage right now because we're living in a different time yeah i, I mean i agree to that i mean I, I have so many absentee owner deals that i've had that they just would cuss me off four four months ago and now they're like well my render's not paying i i gotta get rid of this property 100 percent agree with you on this one if we can zoom out right now into your business and look what is the whole entire structure from top to bottom, if you don't mind uh, sharing that with us. Uh, marketing goes or structure as far as Like uh, marketing, acquisitions teams, driving teams, dispositions. Oh, okay. So I handle marketing. Um, and as far as marketing, we like I said, we have a conveyor belt of, um, of marketing strategies. We have... Uh, there's probably about uh, right now we're down to probably about 35 to 40 different deal finders. Across we only the across the country. We only take them in major cities uh, now. Don't get a deal finder that wants to join your team that's in you know uh, hold on Mississippi. Hold on Mississippi because <laughs> what's your chances of being able to dispo that deal? Find a cash buyer. Find a closing attorney. Nothing against Mississippi. Right. It's just you want to make sure that they're in areas where you know you can get rid of these properties um, quickly. So we have our deal finders across the board. Dedrick handles um, acquisitions. We have a transaction District. coordinator um, that handles all of our transactions from the moment um, the deal is locked up. It's pushed off to her. Um, we VAs. have VAs who handle our um cold calling text also have a lead manager our lead manager is us based because this is the one who is going to have to do a lot more research on some of these leads we get a ton of probate and we need someone who can call these probate departments and things of that nature with really good i tell people all the time um you got to know where you live at and i've tried the va with the cold calling here and it didn't work for an entire year we wasted money on that so i switched her to another area in our business um and now we have a lead manager who handles um overseeing basically all of our marketing but also does a lot of the cold calling as well and then we have mm -hmm. a VA who handles our text messaging um all right, that same va will handle ringless voicemail Cedric handles acquisitions dispositions financing yep. investor relations um, anything that she doesn't handle, she does most of the heavy lifting. But um, and that's just right. in our flip, fix and flip and wholesale operation. Right. We also have a rental property division, Be Polite Properties, for all our buy and holds, right. which Crystal manages. We have a property manager as well. That's under me that handles the property management side. Yeah. We um, have a short term rental entity that's yeah. for our Airbnbs because we've gotten into that niche and we're really scaling our Airbnbs. We got back rentals. into it. Yeah, gotten back into it. Um, and we only, for people who ask us, we only do our property. So we don't do arbitrage um, at all. We do our own homes. Um, nothing against arbitrage, but we got a ton of properties and we buy them in areas that we have multiple strategies for. And it just so happened a lot of them are in um, college areas, things of that nature. So our return is a lot greater with Airbnb. Um, Jose, no, we don't have an operations manager. 
I would be that, right. <laughs> <laughs> that would be <laughs> Yeah. So if I looked at a pie chart of the amount of deals that you're getting in here that uh, Dedrick is just taking down and destroying, getting them all under contract, what percentage of them are in your local market that you could actually drive to? And what are they, what are the percentage of them that are like virtual that like out of state? You know what? It used to be like 80% local and 20% mm -hmm. um, virtual. I was just looking today and right now it's like flipped. It's like 20% local and like 80% virtual. <laughs> so right now we just closed a deal in Cleveland, Ohio that we wholesaled. We just got another one in Charleston, South Carolina. We're doing another one in Fayetteville, North Carolina, which is two, two hours away. We haven't been to Fayetteville in two or three years. We're doing two in Wilmington. We just got on the contract. We're going to make about 40,000 wholesale in those two hours away. Uh, we work in a few in Boston. These are all virtual deals. So it's, it's amazing. We love it. So literally, we can buy houses anywhere around the country. It doesn't matter where it is. Wow. That's impressive. I mean... So this is a pretty common question I get all the time, and my following is like so much, so much tighter than yours. But I, this is what I, what I find. I get a lot of kids, you know, 18, 19 year old, that say, "Hey, I live in Seattle, or I live in Los Angeles, I live in San Francisco, and I really want to get into virtual wholesaling, but I, I'm worried about these objections I get, like, hey, are you local? Things like that." What are some of the tips you can give to kids wanting to get in virtual if they're in like some crazy markets that are like almost impossible to do? Like a Boston. So yeah. one of the things, so I do also have a couple of young ladies that um, are younger that I mentor as well, but I've also known them for um, quite a while and they wanted to get into real estate as well. And um, the advice that I give them is if I would have had someone in front of me the way you do, at 18 and 19, telling me what I'm telling you, um, guiding you through it as well, then you probably wouldn't know me right now because I would be a billionaire. Um, so I always encourage kids that are 18, 17, um, 16, if this is something you're interested in, this is the time for you. But right now you're a sponge and you're gonna be willing to soak up as much as you can. Look for a mentor. Like one of the things I used to tell my nephew, people who are willing to help you at 16 may not be willing to help you at 17. The people who are willing to help you at 17 may not be willing to help you at 18. So the younger you are getting involved in this business, the more people who's going to extend that olive branch and be like, hey, absolutely. This is amazing. You're trying to get into this at such a young age. Absolutely. I'll help you. What do you need? What information do you need? Because. We all want to see them win at such a young age. So whether it's virtual, whether it's local, um, well, if they're that young, I would definitely say start with your backyard. Even if they say, hey, well, you know, what if someone says, you know, are you local? Absolutely. Because all you need is boot ground if you're not. So how do we say it? When you talk to a seller and they're like, well, are you from uh, Decatur, Georgia? And we're sitting here in North Carolina. What do you, how do you respond to that? Um, absolutely. That's it. Absolutely. If they got an accent, then throw the accent in there. Absolutely. <laughs> Whatever it is, you make, make sure you have a local number, but you let them know. Absolutely. Yeah. I am. I'm looking at your house on Google maps right now. You don't see Google maps. <laughs> <laughs> I tell all of my, uh, the VAs, our lead manager, any of them who are calling some of our virtual leads, um, I make sure that they are brushed up on what's local because some people, they're going to want to build rapport. Pull, pull a high school. I don't care if it's my high school if you're calling Boston. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to live over there near English High School or Roxbury Latin. But if you throw something out there that's local in the midst of that conversation, then they're going to be like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, don't know. I drew by that all the time. Yeah. Now their defenses are down. So here's what, what I do. I just act as if. Right. We, we did a deal in L.A. Are you in L.A.? Yeah, I'm, I'm in L.A. Yep. I mean, I'll be there next week. OK, well, so when can I come see the property, Mrs. Jones? Oh, you can come on. Uh, what's today? Wednesday, Friday at five. Oh, man. You know what? I'm actually out of town Friday, but my partner can come over and they'll just get pictures. And then I've, I've walked a thousand houses. And once I see the pictures, I can get a good estimate of what type of repairs it's going to need. And then I can make you an offer. So it doesn't matter if I'm in L.A. I, I've done this enough. You act as if you've done it enough. 
And again, if you have a mentor, they can help guide you through that. So that's how we do it when we get that question. And to play devil's advocate, I think for most people, the most common objection, because I used to do like wholesaling only, only in my market. Then I kind of went out of state and I had some limiting beliefs before I started getting some deals. I think one of the biggest things that stumps people is when a seller might ask them like, what do you mean I have to sign a contract over email? What's this DocuSign? Like, how do you get the sellers over that little hump when they're like 70, 75 years old? Virtual. Can you hear us, Zach? Yeah. Sorry, it dropped, it dropped real quick. Can you oh, repeat no the question? Yeah, no problem. Uh, one of the biggest objections people start getting when they're virtually wholesaling, one of the most limiting beliefs that they get when you're being an acquisitions guy is like, yeah, I'm in LA, whatever, whatever. Uh, you give them the offer, they like the offer, and then like, okay, you're gonna come by, sign the contract, how do we do it? And then you're trying to explain it, but you're like, you're fumbling your words because you're like so new with this about like DocuSign. Like, how do you get an older seller, 70 years or older, over the hump and getting them to sign something over DocuSign virtually? By any means necessary. <laughs> but you also want to make them feel that you're doing this in their best interest. So yeah. you want them to say, hey, listen, I really don't want you having to come all the way to the closing attorney's office. Would it be best if I sent you the mm. same um, via email and you can literally sign them for from your computer? So the more you make um, a seller Sounds feel- about Ms. Long, though. We, we deal with some sellers that are 75, 80. They don't right. even have email. So how do you deal with that? So like case in point. The, my very first cold call that I had um, resulted in a deal, but she also made me work <laughs> for it. So um, she didn't have email. She didn't have a cell phone. She was like 75. She had a house phone and that's it. You have to go over a house like how many times? To Probably go over about 20 times. Not to mention if she saw something that wasn't that didn't have a period, she wanted it fixed in the contract. If it if she saw a double space, she was yep. like, I don't think I need this single space. I hate to be a bother. Girl, I, I said, Lord have mercy. Um, but I had to literally thank God she was not that far from us. But I literally had to keep going back, keep coming back. I think in one day I went back five times for an error that she, it wasn't really an error, but because of her and her age and being anal, she thought it was. So, but at the end of that, her daughters had two houses. There was referrals. She gave us a ton of referrals. One of the things that um, I tell people is, you know, when you're dealing with older individuals, remember they've been here a long time. What's the probability that they don't have other individuals. And just so happened with her, her and her husband uh, had had these rental properties and they used to be in a little investment group. And she said, listen, I got about, you know, it's probably about seven or eight of us still alive. And I'm sure they would want to sell their properties as well. And because I took such amazing care of her, that's one of the first things she did was refer us. Her daughter started calling, then a guy in, in the country or somewhere started calling, hey, I got this referral from Ms. Johnson. Yeah, and, and the referrals just kept coming in because of the How amazing the job. Yeah. Another older couple that we're about to do a um, seller finance deal on, um, he ended up being sick. And I sent him, I had my assistant send him a edible arrangement this week. Wasn't this week or last week? This weekend, yeah, last Friday. Last Friday. And Today, Dedrick calls me like, hey, you remember the couple and we sent them the edible arrangements? I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, her brother just called me and he has a realtor. He was like, listen, my sister told me about an amazing job, how you guys are. I, I will fire this realtor in a minute. Um, let's talk. Can you buy my house? Can you buy my Make, house? <laughs> basically begging us to buy his house. <laughs> that's, um, just That's the way you want to do it. Yeah. Just to add to that, Zach, uh, a few other things. It's really about building rapport. When you build rapport with the relation with the seller, you build that relationship. It, it doesn't matter where you are, right? You find out about their family. How many kids do you have? How many grandkids do you have? What do you do for a living, right? What do you do for fun? Really focus on getting to know that person instead of just focus on the deal and how much money you can make. When you build rapport, none of that stuff mat matters, right? As long as they know you, they like you, and trust you, 
you can tell them, hey, meet me at IHOP and let's sign a contract. They yeah. won't mind because you built rapport. Which we've done. <laughs> yeah. When we first started out and we, we had no our, office. Panera Bread. Yep. You know, get contracts signed. And, and sometimes that's where they're most comfortable at. And we'll say, hey, let's want to meet over lunch. And when people be like, oh, well, what if I don't have an office? How do I get around that? Hey, I'd love to take you to, for lunch and we can go over the contracts. Who's not going to turn who's going to turn down a free lunch or Starbucks? Hey, let's go to Starbucks. I I definitely love to treat you to a lunch and we can go over the contracts there and make you more comfortable for you. And okay. don't and don't forget Zach, good old fashioned mail, US mail. I can't tell you how many contracts we were talking to a 78-year-old seller in Shelby, North Carolina, which is 3 hours away. I'm not driving out there. Hey, we agreed on the price $100,000. Mr. Jones, um, what's your mailing address? I'm going to overnight this over to you because I'm out of town right now. I'm yep. going to overnight it over to you. And I'll, I'll send return posters, just send it back. You send it to them, they sign, send it back. We're on the contract. They don't need email. They don't need DocuSign. Yep. I mean, I'm telling you, rapport has been the biggest game changer for me ever since I started. It is the single difference between people in my market doing deals and not doing deals. Because my market is so crazy. Like there's five wholesalers that just started that are going there. They watch a Max Maxwell video, they get they get hyped up and they all go for a seller. And I always beat them because I know the I know the guy's grandkids. I know his dog's name. I it's 100 percent the top thing. And unfortunately it's not the sexiest thing in the world to sit down with a guy over the phone for 30 minutes, get to know him. But it's the biggest game changer I, I've found. Yeah Max videos will get everybody hyped. Everyone get hyped <laughs> and get into wholesale you see Max's videos. He did it, oh right. my gosh. Wow. So uh, I, I need to ask you guys this uh, because this is a pretty important one. Obviously, real estate, there's no day that is the same in real estate. I mean, I, I can look at you guys and you might seem that it went, you went from zero to 100 just making all this money. But I mean, what were some of your early struggles and some of the struggles you've had since coronavirus happened in real estate investing? Man. It definitely wasn't an overnight success. It took us years to become an overnight, right. what seems like an overnight success. Right. It yeah. took us 18, no, almost 20 months to close our first deal. We started trying to close our first wholesale deal at, and trying to buy a rental January 2017. We didn't close our first deal until August of 2018. That's a struggle, right? We wanted to quit many times. We spent tens of thousands in pursuit of that first deal. Putting it on credit cards, money we didn't have. Then over a hundred thousand in just education, and that's just us strategically, continuously educating ourselves um, on the business. And I tell people that is what paid off tenfold for us because, you know, I know a lot of people's like, "Oh my God, why would you spend so that much on educating yourself?" Because what it did was it shortened that learning curve. So whereas most people, it would take them a year to really get ramped up immediately after closing our first deal um we probably had about five more in the pipeline that was closing all back to back it helped us really shorten our learning curve for marketing we literally hired specialists in these fields to teach us how to drill down on these areas that we didn't know a lot about so when we got rocking and rolling we took off like lightning speed because we had did so much educating um, ourselves, we were educating ourselves so heavily that for the an entire year that it helped us tremendously on the back end. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I'm getting a lot of questions from people. I, I've got, I think I've gotten three about what, what's your YouTube channel? What's your YouTube channel? Um, is it be polite properties? Yeah. So our YouTube channel is be polite properties. It's or good. You, you guys should definitely properties. subscribe to it. Yep. Be polite. A lot of behind the scenes on there. Please subscribe. Uh, what else? We got Facebook, Be Polite, all things Be Polite. Instagram, just type in Be Polite. Yep. Sweet. Just got it right on there. Um, okay, guys. So what we're going to do right now is I'm about to get some questions. Uh, they're about to give you a quick uh, Q&A. So comment below your questions. But uh, while we get that going, I need to ask you guys, together, you've, you've dealt with some crazy real estate. What is your single most craziest real estate story? <laughs> uh, single most craziest, craziest real estate story. Um, craziest hmm. in terms of 
What aspect of craziness? <laughs> I mean, uh, us real estate investors have to deal with a lot of uh, crazy things. I, I mean, a, a deal that took forever to go, meeting someone 20 times. Like, is there any like crazy stories you have uh, in the past three years? I mean, one crazy one is the deal we did over email and we never talked to the seller. So this was, where'd that lead come from? It, uh, it might have been driving for dollars. dollars. Driving for dollars lead. Uh, lead came in. We called the woman. It was an abandoned house. It was dilapidated, foundation issues, everything. We called the woman, called her, never picked up. But um, it was in a great neighborhood. Great area. She emails us after we called her about 15 times. She emails us, hey, um, listen, I've been getting your, your messages. I just wanted to see it, you know, what you wanted to offer me for my house. So we we going back and forth from email. That's great. Tell us a little bit about the property, blah, blah, blah. So after a few emails, we're like, okay, can we hop on the phone and discuss further? She would never pick up the phone. This is like two months. We're negotiating all through email. Now, this woman lives in Colorado. The house is in North Carolina. So she's telling us all this stuff, and literally she would never pick up the phone. So we ended up getting the house under contract for $43,000. And we think, okay, well now we're in the contract. Maybe she'll talk to us on the phone now, and we'll get to put a – still, everything was over email. We ended up wholesaling it for 50 uh, I think it was 56 or 58. We made like 13 grand. And it was all through email. We never talked to her. Everything was through email. And one of the things that I had to tell my husband, because he gets a lead and he immediately wants to call them. Yep. And they I'm won't answer. They don't answer. And I always tell him, he'll be like, oh, well, I called them and I called them. They're not responding. I said, well, how did the lead come in? Well, they texted. Did you text them back? Well, I called them. That's not their preferred method of communication. And I tell so many investors this, always continue with the seller's preferred method of communication until they ask to take it off of their themselves. Um, because you can, they can go ghost. Yeah, you don't want to jump the gun. Right. Let them get comfortable with you first to be like, okay, well, can you just call me and go over it? Because we are literally closing deals now all through text. They don't want to talk on the phone. Um, and we're closing them through text, not just communicating. So we're like, okay, listen, texting them. Hey, the contract is in your inbox. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and they'll text back like, hey, sign the contract, send it back to you. Okay, the closing date is on this date. Everything is through text message because that's what they feel comfortable with. Um, so just keep that in mind when communicating with these sellers. Yeah. All through email. That's that's a first for me. I've never heard about that. That's that's definitely crazy. Wow. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we got some questions here for some people. So uh, we'll let some people ask. Uh, Jose wants to know if you've ever used transactional funding. Absolutely. So when we have a huge assignment fee, like we're going to make 50000 or above. We always use transactional funding. So yep. what that does is it allows you to close on the property using someone else's money hold it for a short term. Usually it's back to back. So like I will close the A to B transaction with the seller at 10 a.m. with trans someone else's money, transactional fund. And at 11 a.m. we'll go in another room and close the B to C transaction between us and our end buyer. We'll pay a fee, usually pay like 1% of, you know, say it's a $100,000 deal, you may pay a $1,000 fee to use that money. But it allows you to mask the fee so that the seller and the buyer don't see how much you're making. You know, we made, we've done wholesale deals. We made 105000 90,000, 70,000. So when you have that size of a deal, you definitely, exactly. yeah, you definitely so want to do a back-to-back -back close. Don't take any chances Yeah, you ever, no. when it's that, especially if you know your seller. If you know your seller is, is counting every dollar on this transaction, that's not the one you want to take a chance on seeing that you're making 40,000 on this deal. Because I've had literally four um, students that are in our um, private group Four students come to us and tell us like, hey, the seller has backed out. How do I get them back on the hook? They backed out the day before. As soon as they got that HUD um, and they saw it being given to the other person, they have backed out. Some have literally walked away at the closing table. Yeah, we've used transactional funding for a $10,000 wholesale fee. Because we knew the seller was counting every penny. So, so it may cost us 750 bucks, right. but I'd rather make 10000 <laughs> right, and spend seven fifty to keep the deal, then lose it because they got upset over the fee. Oh yeah, I, I, countless times I've had uh, uh, people just running, running away after to see the huds, but uh, it, that's huge. 
Um, Jose asks again, do you have a manager, operations manager? I think you've already gone over that. Um, you have a lead manager, right? That would be me. I, I handle all okay. operations. <laughs> okay. Uh, next question here is, uh, Jose asks, who's boots on the ground? How do you build that relationship? Uh, finding people boots on the ground, I think. So boots on the ground, a lot of it is our network. So for example, in Boston, since we lived there for 30 years, we have a huge network of people we can call on and say, hey, all I need you to do is go take pictures of a property. I don't need you to talk to any sellers, or any buyers, just take pictures and video. Now, if you don't have that, if it's a virtual market, uh, social media, you know, Absolutely. things like Facebook groups, um, wholesaling houses elite, you know, deal machine community group saying, hey, you know, I'm Zach, I'm in Florida, but I got a deal in Charlotte. I'll pay someone, I'll give you 75 bucks. I just need somebody to go take pictures for me. So I would network through social media as well. And if you are in a town or in an area where you have family, you went to college in, so you still have friends that are still in the area, tap your network of people that you know firsthand um, and tell them like, hey, listen, I'll, I'll pay you a fee if you can just go take these pictures and this video. Um, be very specific what to tell them um, if the seller talks to them, um, what they can say, what they are not to say. And we say this all the time. You don't need an acquisitions manager in every single state. All you need, and then they have, you know, um, they also have services we like go uh, We Go Look um, and uh, BPO Photo Flow. Um, well, that's, that's what they do. Where they that's all they pictures. do is go and take pictures. So you can like also. Like bucks or 75 bucks. Or yeah, whatever. something like that. So you can also go that route as well. But I'm telling you, once you start thinking of like, oh, man, oh, my God, that's right. Um, my aunt Shawnice lives here. Let me contact her. Maybe she has a 20 year old son that can go, or maybe she can go. Who doesn't want to make, you know, $50 just taking for 30 some, minutes, right? For 30 minutes. And on the flip side of that one, how would you find your drivers or your bird dogs? Um, social media. I think that's okay. one of the best ways. And I always tell people start with friends and family friends before and family. you even yeah. put it on social media. Like, Hey, I'm looking for bird dogs. Uh, start with friends and family, build your cycle, your funnels around them. Um, say, Hey, listen, go to your aunt, any people, anyone who's retired, they're great. Um, to do anyone even college students who are, who are looking for extra money. Um, family members, they're great to and, do it as well. And how we usually say it is, Hey, you know, I'm in real estate, you know, I'm buying houses. Um, whenever you see a rundown, beat up old house, don't text me, right? Because we all know people like your aunt would be like, hey, Zach, I saw this house you may want to buy. They'll text it to you. Thank you, auntie. But don't text it to me. I actually have an app. We give them our app, right? Just take a picture of it, put it in this app. That allows me to track it. Once I close the deal, let's say I make $10,000, I'll give you 10%. I'll give you a $1,000 check for just for sending me the deal. I do all the work. So that's how we typically recruit our deal funds. Yep. Wow. I like how you call it deal finders. It sounds a lot uh, more jazzed up than uh, bird dogs. So yeah, I, I bird dog, right? yeah. Deal finders. <laughs> deal finders. I love it. I love it. Uh, Pringle Pride Property asks, uh, should I complete my real estate license? It's been on my mind. I don't, I don't, I know I don't need it, but I, to make strategic moves. And since this is new to me, I feel like I need to learn more by rolling two ball. Um, we both could. Go ahead. Yeah. So what I would say to you is first figure out what your end goal is. Um, and to get to that end goal, do you need your real estate license? If you are literally just trying to wholesale, build up your cash flow um, quickly, then that would be just wholesaling. And right now what you need to deep dive into is how to wholesale. Um, you don't need a license, you don't for, need that. A license for that. No. unless you are in Chicago or Illinois, sorry. Yeah. Um, but if you're not there, then deep dive into wholesaling. And I'm telling you, it is not as difficult as some people make it. It is literally, literally maybe a five step process to wholesaling. Now it's a lot of work on the back end of just being consistent and keep consistently doing your marketing over and over. But really to answer that question, you know, a real estate license is typically for me and for our business, because one of us are planning on getting it. It's really just to enhance our business and where we're at right now. For leads that may for not be leads, a good fit for wholesale. Not a fit. Exactly. You got to know your area um, as well. And we get a ton of people in our area who don't want um, uh, a wholesale 
deal. They want something more on market um, retail for them for them. So we want to be able to service them as well. So, I mean, I'll answer that question as well. You don't need a license. Now, again, we're all for education. We're both college educated. We're always learning more about real estate, but you don't need a license. How many realtors, Crystal, have actually come to us? They're full time right. realtors and they're like, look, I want to be a wholesaler because yeah. you guys are making way more money than I make on these little commissions. Exactly. So, yeah. So you said, no, I want this to be my career. Okay. So oh, yeah. you want real estate to be your career. Do you want to be a real estate agent? Which is great. If that, that's what you want for a career, I'd say go for it. Absolutely. But if you want to be an investor, it's, it's two different things. Just because you right. get your real estate license doesn't learn investing. It's a different niche within real estate. Right. So be very, um, I'd say, understand that, you know, having your license is great. And then also knowing how to wholesale on the side is even more powerful um, because now you become you can become the investor's realtor. Um, like one niche. of my really, really best friends, he's considered the um, an investor's realtor. So the realtor it, investors turn to when they want to deal. Absolutely. Yep. So I would say look into that. Um, if you're going to license, so you're not just servicing retail clients because the money is on the wholesale side. I'm going to just tell you now, um, you know, our realtor, even selling us, our, literally a good friend of ours who sold us, who was the realtor on our property. We make more in a deal that she made just selling us our property. So that really turned her wheels um, in regards to maybe I'm, I, I should get into this, you know, investing side, this wholesaling side, which she is now doing. So that uh, trust me, seeing one HUD from an investor, especially from you guys, will uh, convert any any uh, realtor. But um, <laughs> so uh, Roland actually asked a pretty good question. I, I have no idea about this because I'm in Florida, uh, but he wants to know for you guys, Boston natives, does wholesaling slow down during the cold Boston winters or is it business as usual? Roland, money never sleeps. Great question, though. Money never sleeps. In Boston, it don't slow down. There's houses being sold every single day Absolutely. on the market and off market. Actually, in Boston, there's some of the neighborhoods we focus on that are red hot areas. There's more properties sold off market than on market. Yep. They're Absolutely. trading hands, and it don't matter how hot or cold it is, properties are being bought and sold all the time. And whenever you get into a, a market like Boston, New York, um, big top 10 Philly, California, certain areas in Los Angeles and California. When you get into that price point, it's really never going to slow down. If you have a deal, there is somebody waiting to get that deal. The numbers make sense. Right. You won't have a problem finding a buyer. It don't matter what markets. season it is. Definitely. That's awesome. So we got D Bailey showing love here. We got Letitia St. Polites in the building. Everyone's loving it. Jose's God's going to continue to bless y'all, man. I, I love it. Everyone's everyone's loving this. Thank you. We appreciate the love, y'all. So last couple of questions here. Uh, this is kind of a weird one, but uh, you guys have kids. Are you guys trying to instill the lessons that you've learned and some of the business tactics that you have onto your kids? Are you pushing them into a career in real estate? What's, what's sort of your goal with that? Absolutely. <laughs> entrepreneurship entrepreneurship whether it's real estate or anything else we just want them to own absolutely something. a thousand percent and i tell people all the time the schools don't teach our kids to be entrepreneurs no. um we have to so if you're waiting for the school to teach your child entrepreneurship um then you fail them not the school because that's not what they're designed to do so from day one i want our kids to be entrepreneurs. I want them to uh, know the benefits of entrepreneurship. Will they work for someone? Absolutely, because I want them to also know and experience what it feels like having a clock in and clock out and like have bag, one telling bag you, groceries, right, bag do, groceries. Do landscaping, we want them to experience all that. Absolutely, because uh, we did. We did, we and did, we yeah. didn't get it handed to us. We didn't grow um, up with silver spoons Absolutely our not, both of us are single parents. So we're not giving our sons anything. They're going to earn every bit of what they get from us. And we tell people we're not, we're not giving them a business. We're teaching them our business so that one day, hopefully they'll step in and then they'll run it. One of the things I told my husband yesterday um, in regards to sports, you know, our sons are amazing athletes. You know, they love sports. They, they love basketball <laughs> uh, and him. Um, 
They love basketball. They love all sports. But I want my kids to, I'm more focused on them being athletic than I am an athlete. Um, because I want them to know that even if he, like my son now, our seven-year-old, loves basketball, diehard basketball fan, and he wants to play basketball. But I've we've worked so much into conditioning them on entrepreneurship. When they ask, I heard him say to someone, he was like, yeah, I'm going to play basketball, but I'm also going to own the team. That was probably my proudest moment as a parent. I kid you not. Well, I didn't even tell him to say that. He right. just and came he up just, with it on his own. He literally just <laughs> said it because of how, what he sees from Osmosis. us. <laughs> is, you know, and what we continue to instill in them is the benefits of entrepreneurship and getting out here and working for what's yours. Um, it's not going to be handed to you because it wasn't handed to us. So we're not handing them anything, but we make sure that that son just got into, you know, one day he went out with his friends last week and started selling rocks to the neighbors. Door Literally, to door. <laughs> door to door selling rocks. In like $3.50? Each, like we him were, and my nephew. We were proud. So proud. Super, <laughs> super proud. So he came back and I had a whole blueprint already of his business that he's, uh, another business of his that he started. And my husband always says, if you can sell. If you can sell, you'll never be broke. You'll never be broke. So we tell <laughs> parents. Teach your kids now to sales. Sales is everything. Sales runs everything. We tell people, people like, um, you know, uh, these basketball players and football players um, are rich. The people who are signing those checks are wealthy. There's a the difference. Yeah. So, yeah, that's really what we want to teach, Zach, is generational wealth. I know when we first got on, you talked about how, you know, the, the Rick in your business is your dad. That's right. You're trying to tell. So there's a reason why, you know, what you gravitated and going in business with your dad. Obviously, he must have laid a great example for right. you to make you mm -hmm. want to go to the business and carry on the torch. That's exactly what we want to do for our sons. We try to model an example of, hey, listen, your mom and dad, they went to college. They got good jobs, but corporate America wasn't for them. They weren't able to live their potential. So they decided to go into entrepreneurship. We want to give them an opportunity. Look, they don't have to be entrepreneurs, but if they want, we want to give them that opportunity and that education from a young age. Yep. So when we drive around town now, our kids are just from osmosis. They're conditioned for real estate. Like if they see if they see a we buy houses sign, go when they're driving by, they'll be like, "Mom and Dad, is that your sign?" And we'll be like, "No, that's not our sign." And someone they'll be like, "Well, why do they have that sign in our town?" Yep. <laughs> because they're just conditioned for it. They're like, "Do you know them?" <laughs> so. Yeah, wow, I would be, I'd be careful the next fifteen years. The <laughs> lights are coming. They're coming. Uh, that's exciting, guys. Oh boy, I want my son to flip his first house at like twelve. Twelve? Like, Is that the date? Okay. I twelve years old. Okay. Hey, I'll sign the contracts all day, but I want him to know how to flip his first house at, at twelve. That's exciting. I, I mean, I any kids would be blessed to have you guys as parents. Thanks. Here's my last question for you. Uh, I ask this question to every single person on the podcast here. Let me take this off. Um, I started real estate when I was 17. I had to do it myself. I had the range of bucks in my bank account. I quit my job. If we took everything from you, you're still married, you still have kids, but you had 200 bucks, what would you two specifically do to become the next Polites? <laughs> That's an amazing question. That's so if we question. only had 200 bucks and everything else was stripped from us, what would we do to become the polites again? Um, we would sell. We would sell something. We would go right back into sales and flip that 200. We would um, sell our car. We would sell anything of value to build up a little more capital. And we would start hitting the streets, driving for dollars. We'd be hitting the pavement. Yep. Not door knocking. And if it was real estate, we would be cold calling ourselves. Two hundred dollars, probably be gas money. <laughs> but right. um, we would, we would, if it was real estate that we were going to go right back into, then we would drive for dollars. Um, it we just needed to build our capital back up and quickly. Um, we would get into selling things to build it up quicker. Wow, that's. That's amazing. Uh, the biggest lesson I always get from asking that question is you can strip them the money from someone. Everyone, I mean, you've said like, why are you spending all this money on education? You strip the money out, 
the mind's still working there and I will make that money tenfold. I, uh, it's amazing guys. I really appreciate you guys coming on here. Again, I don't think we talked about too much, uh, but you guys are amazing mentors and educators too. Uh, can you talk about a little bit about your education side? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we've documented our journey, Zach, from 2017 when we first started. If you scroll through Instagram and look at our timeline, you can actually see the evolution of our business, of how we started and how we've scaled. Um, and as we document the journey, people would ask us, you know, even before we were as successful as we are now, and we, we still feel like we're just getting started. Yep. But they would ask us, like, how are you guys doing it? How are you finding these deals? You know, how, how are you doing this? And we started like sharing and, you know, sharing all this content. And then people started asking us, you know, can you mentor us? Can you coach us? And although we would love to do that, you know, just we don't have the hours in the day to do it one on one. Right. We're married. We have like eight different companies we own. We have two kids. Right. So finally, like a year, almost two years ago, we we're like, let's create an online course. Let's create a course to lay out our whole system and show people exactly how we've been able to do what we've done. And that's when we created the Driving for Dollars of a Lightweight course. And that course has done extremely well. I mean, the reviews on the course have you know, we've helped people close their first deal. We've helped investors who are making 10, 20,000 a month go to making 50 to 100,000 a month. So, you know, if anyone's interested in that, just click on our link in our bio on Instagram or go to driverforDollarsCourse.com. You can get all the information on the course. And then also we have a Facebook community for people who are interested in joining that community and, and plugging in with us. We do a weekly Q&A call. So, yeah, that's what and we And it's more like a mastermind. It's like a mini mastermind. It is yeah. because we... Of our resources, a lot of the individuals in that group are all doing over six figures. They're also developers, um, GCs, major um, investors. So we all pretty much uh, mastermind together every week as well. So it's a lot of fun. Let me pull this up for you. I want to get your the right handles for you guys because I don't want to get this wrong. So let me type this in for you. So it's Be Polite Properties, guys on Instagram. That is literally where I found them. They are amazing. Definitely give them a, a shout out. So it's at Be Polite Properties um, on Instagram. Everything. Everything across the board is Be Polite Properties. Yeah, no, Instagram will have our super social, which is like Linktree, and it'll have links to all of our resources and where you can find us. Cool. Oh, thank you guys so much for going on here today. I mean, the, the people are, this is probably one of the most engaged audiences we've had in a while. I mean, I think you've pumped everyone up. If you don't listen to this interview and not leave the house right now and start driving for dollars for five hours, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> I'm excited for this. What are some of the parting thoughts that you have for our audience before we uh, hop off today? Yeah, I just want to say we appreciate the opportunity. Um, kudos to you being your age. You fire us up, right? Like Crystal said, you know, if I would have kno known what I know now at 17, 18, 19, 20, I would be a billionaire by now, right? But everything it has is has its due time. But my my thing I want to impart on people is that look, we're we're no we're not special, right? We work our butts off, we work hard. If we can do this, you can, right? She was raised by a single mom. I was raised by a single mom on Section Eight, one of the roughest neighborhoods of Boston. If we can make it out of there and become successful, um, anybody can do it. There's opportunities everywhere if you're willing to work for it. And what I would say is, um, so the mantra that I live my life by, and I have since I was 11, probably 12, when I first saw the quote written on something, uh, you make a living by what you get, you make a life by what you give. Wow. And I try to continuously give, um, and that's how I live my life. My husband tells everyone, if she could give it all away, she would, um, which is true. I, I I am definitely a giver. I really want to see everyone succeed. So getting cut out here. So we pop back on. No matter what keep trying it. Trust me, it will click and you will get it. Don't give up. Don't give up keep under going. any circumstances. And if you have to slide in somebody's DM, even ours, so we get in there um, every now and then and we try and answer questions when we're up late at night because that's literally like our only time. Um, 
to sit down for a second and we try to answer as many questions, especially from people who just need that extra validation or need that extra help. Um, we try to get in there and, and answer their questions. So don't be afraid to slide in all these do rules inboxes. Even if they don't respond, keep sending them messages. Get on their lives and ask them the question on their live, but get your questions answered. Wow. Boom. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. You can change lives today. Thank you guys so much. Thanks You're for